Yesterday I started talking about the power of your imagination. I tell you, this is something that I've never really heard anybody teach on. I've heard them talk about vision, and uh, that's really the same thing. Uh, matter of fact, the definition of vision, according to the American Heritage Dictionary, it says it's a mental image produced by the imagination. So when you're talking about vision, you're talking about your ability to see something with your heart that you can't see with your physical eyes. In other words, it may not be a reality at that moment, but this is what the Bible says faith is over in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is your ability to see something that is real. It's just off in the future. It hasn't come into physical manifestation yet, but it's real. Man, that is important. I'm going to be talking about that more. And anyway, I've got this book entitled The Power of Imagination. This truth has revolutionized my life. It has totally changed everything, not only in my life, but in the lives of thousands, maybe millions of people have been impacted because of the truths that are in this book. Now, we're offering this for a donation of any amount, but we have a brief summary of this entitled Believing is Seen. I love the little cover on this. My uh, uh, media department put this together, and I really like this. But, you know, you need to have childlike faith, but not fantasy, but imagination. Some people will define imagination as fantasy. They talk about a talking mouse or a talking dog or a flying elephant. That's fantasy. That's not what I'm talking about. But I'm talking about your ability to see something with your heart. And did you know God made us this way? Matter of fact, let me take this passage of Scripture from over in Genesis chapter 11. And this is about the Tower of Babel. And it says in Genesis chapter 11 that the people that were dispersed after the flood, they said in verse 4, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven and let us make a name lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. This is an amazing, amazing statement. And of course, the story goes on. I'm not going to take all of the time to read this. I'm really not talking about the Tower of Babel and the division of the languages. But what I am pointing out is that people's imagination is so powerful that nothing that you can imagine can be restrained unto you. And God was even threatened. God's purposes and plans for mankind was threatened by their imagination. So you know what God did? He came down and confused their languages, which, in, which uh, kept them from being able to communicate with each other, and it limited their, you know, their uh, synergy that comes together when people come together. And so God saw that it, your imagination was so important that it was going to thwart his plans for mankind. And so he did something to limit that imagination. He limited communication so that they wouldn't be able to communicate and have this synergy that comes through unity like that. That's amazing. Something that was a challenge to God is powerful. God made us with an imagination. Did you know, I remember when they came out with the Star, um, Star Trek stuff, and they had this replicator is what they called it. And they'd just go up and speak to this thing. At that time, did you know there was no such thing as speaking and some computer being able to recognize your voice? That was just fantasy is what a lot of people thought. But it was the imagination. And did you know now they do that? You can speak. Matter of fact, I spoke to my phone today. <laughs> it just amazes me that you can speak to a phone and it understands what you're saying. That's quite a deal for a phone to understand what I'm saying. I remember when they first started experimenting with this artificial intelligence and, you know, they were uh, getting to where a computer could recognize your voice. It could never understand my Texas twang. That was uh, other people it could get, but not me. But now I can just speak to my phone and my phone will tell me all kinds of things. 
Anyway, I remember when that was not reality, and yet somebody imagined it, and guess what? It came to pass. They would speak to this thing called a replicator and say, I want this tea or, or whatever, and they could. Ju- it would just make these things. Did you know that we now have replicators? And I just read this week that they are dealing with a firm in Texas that makes, they replicate houses. They build all of the materials out of a replicator and they build houses, and now NASA is working with them to replicate houses. They're going to put a replicator on the moon and replicate houses and build houses so that people can stay there long term. Now, again, this is still off in the future, but this is what people are imagining, and I guarantee you anything that you can imagine can come to pass. Your imagination is powerful. The sad fact is that with most people, our imagination only imagines evil things. Matter of fact, over in Romans chapter 1, it talks about in verse 21 that they became vain in their imaginations, and then it gives progressive steps away from God, and it turns uh, into homosexuality and all of these things as being like the last step before you just totally give yourself over to evil. And it says that it begins with the imagination. You know, here's another passage of Scripture over here in Genesis chapter 6. It says in verse 5, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Did you know that evil can't dominate you without you, first of all, imagining it? Now, that may not connect with you. Here's another way of saying this. Did you know that you can't go anywhere in your physical body that you haven't already been in your mind or, more specifically, in your imagination? If you can't imagine it, you can't do it. Now, most of us have not really sat down and thought about how things work, but I can guarantee you that is absolutely true. A passage of Scripture that goes along with this is talking about Abraham and Sarah, and this is in Hebrews chapter 11, and in verse 15, it says, And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. What this is saying is that for them to return to Ur of the Chaldees, which God told them to forsake and to leave and get out of there, for them having opportunity to return to where God told them to come out of would have been sin. It would have been temptation. So you could say this verse this way, that you can't be tempted with something that you don't think. If Abraham never thought about Ur of the Chaldees, he would never be tempted to go back to Ur of the Chaldees. But did you know Abraham was a very prosperous man when he lived in Ur of the Chaldees? He was very prosperous, and God told him to leave his family, to leave everything, and to go out into a place. He didn't even know where he was going. He just knew it wasn't Ur of the Chaldees. It was going to be someplace else. And so God told him to forsake all of that. And he went out, and it goes on to say here in Hebrews chapter 11 that they were looking for a country, not a physical country, but they were looking for God, and they were looking for a place in God And the Lord had promised him that he would make him the father of many nations. He never saw that with his physical eyes. During Abraham's lifetime, he only had Ishmael, which was a product of the flesh. That was never God's will for him. He made some mistakes along the way. And then he had Isaac, the promised son. He only had two children, and really the Lord told him that Ishmael wasn't even one of his children. That was totally a work of the flesh. He says, take your son, your only son, Isaac in Genesis chapter 22 and sacrifice him. He called Isaac his only son. So Abraham in his lifetime, he lived to be 175 years old. And during that period of time, he came out and into the promised land when he was 75 years old. So for 100 years, he never saw the total fulfillment of what God promised him. But did you know what God said? That your children will be as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore? It came to pass. It just didn't come to pass right then. didn't come to pass in his lifetime. He also never actually owned any property in Israel except the burying place where he buried his wife. 
He didn't see the fulfillment of those things. He didn't see it with his physical eyes, but he saw it in his heart. And that's the reason that God called him the father of faith. And Romans chapter 4 talks about all of this. He saw things. He didn't see it with his physical eyes, but he saw it in his heart. You know what that was? That was imagination. And this is saying that if he had been thinking about what he left, he would have been tempted to go back. I'm just imagining now. I can't prove this to you. I haven't seen it. It's not recorded in Scripture, but I imagine he had his own house when he lived in Ur of the Chaldees. He probably had his own friend. He had his own uh, neighborhood and things like that around him. Did you know when he left and did what God told him, he lived in a tent. And... ABRAHAM PROBABLY LOST SOME THINGS. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, THERE WAS TIMES THAT BECOMING A NOMAD AND JUST NOT HAVING A FIXED PLACE, IT WOULD HAVE BEEN EASY FOR HIM TO SIT DOWN AND THINK ABOUT BACK IN HER, THE CALDEES, I HAD A PLACE. I WAS PROBABLY A LEADER. PEOPLE LOOKED UP TO ME. HERE HE WAS. HE WAS A STRANGER IN A STRANGE LAND. AND HE WAS CONSTANTLY HAVING TO MOVE AROUND. IF HE WOULD HAVE SAT DOWN AND LOOKED AT WHAT HE WAS SEEING WITH HIS PHYSICAL EYES AND CONTRAST THAT WITH WHAT HE GAVE UP, HE WOULD HAVE BEEN TEMPTED TO GO BACK. BUT IT'S ALSO ACCURATE TO SAY THAT IF YOU DON'T GO BACK IN YOUR IMAGINATION AND THINK ABOUT THINGS THAT YOU'VE GIVEN UP, THEN YOU WON'T BE TEMPTED. I COULD BE A GREAT MAN OF GOD IF I WAS NEVER TEMPTED TO DO ANYTHING ELSE. BUT SEE, THE PROBLEM IS WE ALLOW OUR IMAGINATION TO BE HIJACKED, AND WE ALLOW OUR IMAGINATION TO TAKE US PLACES THAT IT SHOULD NEVER GO. Well, that is a strong statement right there. You know, we have students that come to our Bible college all of the time, and they come because God has spoken something to them, and they may not use this terminology, but in their imagination, they've got a vision that God has something more for their life. They may not know exactly what it is, but they are leaving in obedience to God. They leave their home. They leave their families. They leave their security. SOME OF THEM, YOU KNOW, HAVE HAD A JOB AND MAYBE THEY'RE PUSHING TOWARDS RETIREMENT AND THEY GIVE EVERYTHING UP TO MOVE HERE AND TO COME TO SCHOOL. AND THEN WHEN THEY GET HERE, ALL OF A SUDDEN THE REALITY OF, MAN, YOU HAVE TO GET UP AND BE AT SCHOOL AT 8 O'CLOCK IN THE MORNING. SOME OF THEM ARE NOT EARLY RISERS AND SO IT BEGINS TO START, uh, YOU KNOW, BEING SOMETHING THAT IS uh, A SACRIFICE FOR THEM. SOME OF THEM, THE ALTITUDE BOTHERS SOME PEOPLE. WE'RE NEARLY AT 9,000 FEET. I NEVER EVEN THOUGHT ABOUT THIS, BUT THERE'S SOME PEOPLE THAT, MAN, THAT BOTHERS THEM. THE DRYNESS OF THE CLIMATE. SOME PEOPLE'S FINGERS uh, BEGIN TO CRACK AND STUFF, AND YOU HAVE TO USE LOTION. YOU HAVE TO DRINK A LOT MORE WATER. Uh, PERSONALLY, I BELIEVE THAT THE BEAUTY OF COLORADO AND EVERYTHING IS WELL WORTH ANYTHING THAT COMES WITH IT. BUT PEOPLE GET HERE AND THEY REALIZE THAT THE COST OF LIVING HERE IN WOODLAND PARK, COLORADO IS MUCH HIGHER THAN WHERE IT WAS. SOME OF THEM, THE CLIMATE, THE COLD, uh, YOU KNOW, THEY COME FROM A WARM CLIMATE. SOME OF THEM, THEY'RE AROUND uh, THE OCEAN AND WATER. WE DON'T HAVE AN OCEAN IN COLORADO. AND ANYWAY, ALL OF THESE THINGS, WHEN PEOPLE COME HERE, THEY COME BECAUSE OF VISION. AND THERE IS NOTHING LIKE THE FIRST DAY OF SCHOOL. I TELL YOU, IT IS PROBABLY MY FAVORITE DAY OF THE ENTIRE YEAR IS TO COME TO THE VERY FIRST OPENING RALLY IN SCHOOL BECAUSE PEOPLE ARE COMING. THEY'RE FRESH. THEY'VE GOT NOTHING BUT VISION, IMAGINATION IN FRONT OF THEM. AND IT'S EXCITING. BUT THEN ALL OF THE FINANCIAL THINGS BEGIN TO COME TO PASS. ALL OF A SUDDEN THEY'RE HAVING TROUBLE FINDING A PLACE TO uh, LIVE. They're, finding, THEY'RE HAVING TROUBLE FINDING A JOB. THEY RECOGNIZE THE COST OF LIVING IS HIGHER. AND YOU KNOW WHAT? PEOPLE BEGIN TO START THINKING ABOUT, MAN, BACK WHERE I CAME FROM. I, had, I AT LEAST HAD A PLACE TO LIVE. I HAD A GUARANTEED JOB. I HAD THIS. IF YOU GO TO THINKING THAT WAY, I GUARANTEE YOU, ACCORDING TO THIS VERSE, YOU WILL HAVE OPPORTUNITY TO RETURN. YOUR ACTIONS ARE LINKED TO WHAT YOU THINK AND EVEN MORE SPECIFICALLY TO WHAT YOU IMAGINE. IF A PERSON WHO COMES TO SCHOOL AND THEY HAVE THIS GREAT IMAGINATION, THEY'RE JUST THINKING ABOUT WHAT DOES GOD HAVE FOR ME AND THEY'RE DREAMING ABOUT THE FUTURE, BUT THEN THEY GET INTO SOME HARDSHIP AND THEY BEGIN TO START THINKING ABOUT RETURNING, THINKING ABOUT WHAT I'VE LEFT, WHAT I'VE GIVEN UP, DID YOU KNOW THAT'LL TEAR THEM? IT'LL PULL THEM IN A DIFFERENT DIRECTION. BUT ON THE OTHER HAND, IF YOU GET TO WHERE ALL YOU DO IS LOOK FORWARD, YOU AREN'T DRIVING LOOKING AT YOUR REAR VIEW MIRROR. 
YOU GOT TO LOOK FORWARD. YOU GOT TO FORGET THE THINGS THAT ARE BEHIND. AND IF YOU START HEADING IN THAT DIRECTION AND JUST KEEP YOUR EYES FOCUSED ON WHAT GOD HAS in plan, plan FOR YOU in, IN ADVANCE, WELL, THEN THAT'S YOUR IMAGINATION AND THAT'S POWERFUL. BUT SEE, YOU CAN'T DO ANYTHING WITHOUT YOUR IMAGINATION. IF THEY HAD BEEN THINKING ABOUT IMAGINING WHERE THEY CAME FROM, THEY WOULD HAVE BEEN DRAWN BACK THERE. AND THIS IS TRUE WITH EVERY PERSON. YOU KNOW, I'VE GIVEN THIS TESTIMONY BEFORE, BUT I WAS RAISED IN A CHRISTIAN HOME IN ARLINGTON, TEXAS, IN A VERY CONSERVATIVE AREA. I WENT TO A VERY CONSERVATIVE CHURCH, AND uh, I'M NOT SURE THAT THIS WAS ALL MY CHOOSING, BUT NONETHELESS, I WAS RAISED IN NEARLY A VACUUM. AND I JUST DIDN'T KNOW ANYTHING ABOUT DRUNKENNESS, DRUG ADDICTS, uh, DRUG USE. Uh, WE DIDN'T HAVE HOMELESS PEOPLE THAT I WAS AWARE OF. THERE PROBABLY WAS, BUT IT NEVER REGISTERED WITH ME. I NEVER GOT INTO, uh, YOU KNOW, I NEVER WATCHED ANY OF THE UNGODLY MOVIES ABOUT SEXUAL THINGS. I'M SURE THAT I HEARD ABOUT PROSTITUTION AND ABOUT HOMOSEXUALITY, AND I'M SURE THAT I HEARD OF THOSE THINGS, BUT IT WASN'T FOR ME, AND I NEVER FOCUSED ON IT. IT NEVER WAS A PART OF MY THINKING. AND BECAUSE OF ALL THAT, RIGHT AFTER I HAD MY ENCOUNTER WITH THE LORD ON MARCH THE 23rd, 1968, MY MOTHER THOUGHT THAT I HAD LOST MY MIND BECAUSE, I MEAN, I JUST GAVE EVERYTHING I HAD TO GOD. I HAD FRIENDS THAT MOVED IN WITH ME, AND WE WOULD STAY UP AND GET TWO OR THREE HOURS SLEEP A NIGHT IS ALL WE GOT, AND WE WOULD BE STUDYING THE WORD AND PRAYING. AND uh, ANYWAY, SHE WAS CONCERNED, SO SHE PUT ME INTO A BAPTIST GROUP THAT WAS GOING TO BURN SWITZERLAND at, TO A BILLY GRAHAM CONFERENCE. AND THAT WAS THE FOCUS OF IT. BUT ALONG THE WAY, WE, YOU KNOW, HAD TOURIST THINGS ALONG THE WAY. SO THE VERY FIRST NIGHT THAT WE WERE GOING ON THIS, uh, ON THIS TRIP, I WENT TO NEW YORK CITY. AND HERE I AM, A HICK FROM TEXAS, NEVER HAD BEEN OUT OF TEXAS, AND I WENT TO NEW YORK CITY, AND WE STAYED RIGHT THERE ON TIMES SQUARE. AND I GUARANTEE YOU, I WAS SEEING AND HEARING THINGS THAT I HAD NEVER HEARD BEFORE. BUT I WAS SO IN LOVE WITH THE LORD THAT I WAS WITNESSING TO PEOPLE. THEY HAD PROBABLY A HUNDRED PROSTITUTES LINED UP ON 42nd AND SOMETHING STREET, AND THERE WAS PROBABLY A HUNDRED PROSTITUTES LINED UP ALONG THIS WALL DOWN THIS STREET. IT NEVER DAWNED ON ME WHAT THEY WERE. AGAIN, I PROBABLY HEARD ABOUT THAT, BUT IT WASN'T MY FOCUS. ALL I SAW WAS THESE GIRLS, AND I WENT DOWN THE ROW AND PASSED EVERY ONE OF THEM OUT OF TRACK. AND I STOOD THERE ON THE STREET AND BEGAN TO PREACH TO THEM. I EMPTIED THE ENTIRE STREET. <laughs> I GOT RID OF ALL of THE PROSTITUTES. AND I WALKED DOWN ALLEYS, AND I GUESS, YOU KNOW, I'D HEARD ABOUT GANGS, BUT it, IT, WE DIDN'T HAVE GANGS WHERE I GREW UP. IT JUST WASN'T ANYTHING I THOUGHT ABOUT. AND SO I'D WALK DOWN ALLEYS AND SEE GANGS, PEOPLE WITH THESE SPIKES AND ALL BLACK STUFF AND WEIRD hair, HAIRDOS AND STUFF. IT NEVER DAWNED ON ME THAT THAT WAS DANGEROUS. I'D JUST GO UP AND PASS THEM ALL OUT OF TRACK, AND I WITNESSED TO EVERY SINGLE THING I SAW, AND PEOPLE WERE AVOIDING ME LIKE THE PLAGUE. AND ANYWAY, AS I WAS PREACHING TO ALL OF THESE PROSTITUTES, I HAD A PIMP COME UP TO ME, AND HE TRIED TO SELL ME ONE OF HIS GIRLS. AND HE WAS USING THIS STREET LANGUAGE THAT I DIDN'T TALK THAT WAY. IT'S NOT THE WAY WE TALKED IN TEXAS. AND I DIDN'T UNDERSTAND WHAT HE WAS SAYING, AND I JUST KEPT SAYING, WHAT? WHAT ARE YOU? <laughs> AND ANYWAY, THIS GUY TALKED TO ME FOR A WHILE, AND FINALLY, I NEVER WILL FORGET, HE JUST TURNED AROUND, THREW HIS HANDS UP IN THE AIR LIKE THIS, AND SHOOK HIS HEAD LIKE, WHAT ROCK DID THIS KID CRAWL OUT FROM UNDER? AND HE JUST WALKED OFF. AND ANYWAY, WHEN I GOT BACK AT 2 OR 3 IN THE MORNING TO MY HOTEL ROOM, AND I WAS STAYING WITH THESE OTHER GUYS, I WAS TELLING THEM, YOU'LL NEVER BELIEVE WHAT THIS GUY WAS SAYING TO ME, AND I STARTED REPEATING IT, AND THEY HAD TO EXPLAIN TO ME WHAT HE WAS DOING that he was offering one of his girls to me for the evening. But you know, here's my point in relating all that. Guess what? I wasn't tempted because I didn't ever go there in my mind. I had never seen myself doing that. I had never watched anybody else. I didn't watch those kind of movies where they had extramarital relationships. It was not a part of my mind, my thinking, and because of it, I wasn't the least bit tempted. IF YOU'RE TEMPTED WITH SEXUAL SIN, IT'S BECAUSE YOU'VE ALREADY BEEN THERE IN YOUR IMAGINATION. AND YOU MAY NOT HAVE GONE OUT AND PURSUED IT, 
BUT IN OUR CULTURE TODAY, WE ARE HAVING SEXUAL, UNGODLY THINGS JUST THROWN AT US EVERY TIME YOU TURN AROUND. THEY EVEN SELL TOOTHPASTE TRYING TO USE SEX ON uh, ADVERTISEMENTS AND STUFF. SO WE ARE BEING BOMBARDED WITH THIS. I'M NOT SAYING THAT YOU NECESSARILY GO OUT AND PURSUE IT, BUT YOU HAVE TO DO MORE THAN JUST SAY, YOU KNOW, NOT BE THE ONE WHO'S THE AGGRESSOR. YOU HAVE TO ACTUALLY LEARN HOW TO DEFEND YOURSELF AGAINST ALL OF THESE THOUGHTS AND IMAGES THAT ARE BOMBARDING US EVERY SINGLE DAY. BUT IF YOU ARE TEMPTED WITH SEXUAL SIN, YOU'VE BEEN THERE IN YOUR MIND ALREADY. YOU'VE BEEN THERE IN YOUR IMAGINATION. YOU'VE SEEN IT IN MOVIES. YOU'VE READ IT IN BOOKS, AND YOU'VE LET THOSE WORDS PAINT A PICTURE. AND SO YOU CAN SIT THERE AND WHITE KNUCKLE IT AND HOLD ON AND SAY, OH, GOD, HELP ME TO NOT GO and OUT AND COMMIT ADULTERY. BUT YOU KNOW WHAT? IT'S EVEN BETTER TO JUST STOP THE CONCEPTION RATHER THAN TRYING TO STOP THE BIRTH OF ALL OF THOSE THINGS THAT YOU'VE DONE. AND THAT CONCEPTION STARTS IN YOUR IMAGINATION. YOU KNOW, I'M OUT OF TIME TODAY, SO I'LL JUST MAKE REFERENCE TO THIS, AND I'LL GO INTO EXPLANATION TOMORROW. BUT THIS IS EXACTLY WHAT IT SAYS IN ISAIAH 26, 3, THE LORD WILL KEEP HIM IN PERFECT PEACE WHOSE MIND IS STAYED UPON HIM BECAUSE HE TRUSTETH IN HIM. THE WORD MIND RIGHT THERE IN ISAIAH 26, 3 IS THE HEBREW WORD YETSER, Y-E-T-S-E-R, AND THE ONLY DEFINITION OF THAT WORD IN THE STRONG'S CONCORDANCE IS CONCEPTION. IT'S IN YOUR MIND THAT YOU CONCEIVE THINGS, AND THAT EXACT SAME WORD, Y-E-T-S-E-R, IS THE ONE THAT IN GENESIS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 5, IT SAYS THE IMAGINATION OF THEIR HEART WAS ONLY EVIL CONTINUALLY. THAT EXACT SAME WORD THAT WAS TRANSLATED MIND IN ISAIAH 26, 3 WAS TRANSLATED IMAGINATION IN GENESIS CHAPTER 6, VERSE 5. SO YOUR MIND, YOUR IMAGINATION SPECIFICALLY IS WHERE YOU CONCEIVE THINGS. AND IF YOU CAN'T SEE IT ON THE INSIDE, YOU WON'T SEE IT ON THE OUTSIDE. IF YOU SEE IT ON THE INSIDE, YOU WILL SEE IT ON THE OUTSIDE UNLESS YOU DO SOMETHING TO STOP THAT BIRTH. 